Oui, bonjour. Euh, mon nom est Jean Tirole et je suis très ravi de vous accueillir, euh, chers étudiants, chers collègues, euh, chers lycéens et professeurs des lycées euh, Fermat, Rive Gauche, aux années Saint-Joseph-la-Salle. Euh, avant de, que je présente Marianne, euh, je voudrais dire qu'il y, y a des écouteurs, des casques, si vous voulez euh, en profiter. Euh, après la conférence de Marianne, il y aura des questions-réponses et euh, des micros se baladeront dans les allées. Donc, si vous voulez poser des questions, ce sera le bon moment. The Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize is awarded every year uh, to an international, econ international economist who has, who has made an outstanding contribution to theoretical and or empirical research. This year's prize goes to Marianne Bertrand, who is professor of economics at the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business. Marianne is an applied economist with interest in labor economics, corporate finance and development. She has had a stellar career that has stretched across an extremely broad universe of research areas, but she has uh, striked consistently, she has focused on primes that directly impact the common good, targeting social injustice and guiding policymakers toward practical solutions. She has worked on various forms of discrimination, racial, gender, etc., in various contexts, the judiciary, education, hiring, promotions, and also involving conscious and unintended discrimination. Economics and society in general is in desperate need of talented, rigorous, and original thinkers like Marianne. She has been a role model, a mentor, and a champion to the young women we hope to see entering this field. She adopts behavioral insights from sociology and psychology. She also extends them. Uh, she has shown, for example, that advertising persuades by appealing more to intuition than to reasons. It's one thing to, to have the in intuition for that, it's another thing to demonstrate it. Marianne is perfectly at home in what she describes as today's messy economics, uh, which favor realism and context of a grand series and tidy mathematical models, which are fine as well, but <laughs> uh, she excels at that. No. Um, this approach of messy economics has been essential to our research career. Much of, which, uh, much of which has been devoted to measuring inequalities, understanding their causes, and studying solutions, helping researchers and policymakers to focus their efforts where they will be more, most effective in closing the gap. To measure racial inequalities in the US labor market, for example, she used an ingenious field experiment to demonstrate that job applicants from African American origin, uh, I mean, African-American sounding names, I should say, uh, receive 50% fewer callbacks for interviews than those with white sounding names. This work has since been replicated in many countries, and unfortunately also in France with uh, uh, North African sounding names. Um, she has worked a lot on the glass ceiling and actually she will be talking about gender inequality today. Uh, as you all know, women still have a hard time reaching the top echelons, top positions in corporation and the public sectors. There are, of course, many reasons for that, but Marian has been a leader on reflecting on their causes, uh, gender gaps in education, psychological attributes, demand for flexible time allocation, outright discrimination against them, and the efficacy of alternative policies, family-friendly work environment, gender neutral, uh, parental leave, affirmative action. She has actually evidence from a 2003 law in Norwich, in, in Norway, where the boards were mandated to have at least 40% of women. That has been extended in many places in Europe. Um, and with some exciting news or intriguing news, uh, the, the women who were hired uh, afterwards to be on board actually were at least as qualified as, as the predecessors. So that's good news, but at the same time, women who didn't make it onto the boards actually didn't benefit from a spillover effect. Um, employers and the family are not, the, and, and uh, the parents are not the only culprit, unfortunately. Uh, Marianne also has a paper um, 
which uh, is fascinating and disturbing on the gender identity norm among partners. I guess you are going to talk about that as well, um, where men don't like women to make more money than they do. And that shows up very clearly in the statistics and also in the career path of women and their labor market participation. Um, development, uh, as you know, the Nobel Prize, which will be awarded in a few days, uh, to Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and Michael Kramer recognizes their careful use of randomized controlled trials to pinpoint policy improvements to help the world's poorest. Um, Marianne has, all, all, has also been a, a leading contributor in this field, and she has worked extensively on discrimination and corruption in the US and India, for example. Uh, she works as a co-chair of the Chicago Booth Restanding Center for Social Sector Innovation, as chair for the Poverty Lab at the University of Chicago Urban Labs, and as a director on the board of directors of the uh, JPAL uh, Poverty Action Lab. She has also worked on corporate finance, and then I'll stop there because you want to listen to her and not to me. <laughs> um, she has made major contribution to the study of corporate uh, finance, CEO pay, and incentives, so for example, she has studied the adoption of takeover laws in various states in, of the US. And she has found out that majors may not be empire builders, but rather be, have a preference for a quiet life. So for example, if you are protected through takeover laws, uh, you, you close fewer firms, but you also create fewer ones, um, and also you pay higher wages to your employees. She also works on uh, US uh, firms and how they use tax ex exempt uh, charitable donations to lobby politicians. Uh, corporate social responsibility is, of course, a big theme here at TSC. Uh, actually, on, on Friday, we had a conference on this spe specific uh, topic just last Friday. And that's going to be one of the theme of the conference, uh, which is going to take place on, on Thursday and Friday at the TSC Sustainable Finance, Finance Center. Marianne, unfortunately, won't be able to attend physically, uh, uh, thanks to the event uh, we know for Thursday, but she will be there uh, virtually, so she will be taking uh, part of the conference and, and talking about the role of uh, corporate philanthropy on the political process. Finally, uh, Marianne, as you will expect, has received uh, many prestigious awards, including the American Economic Association 2004 Ellen Bennett Research Prize and the Society of Labor Economists 2012 Rosen Prize. She says she doesn't like the weight of expectation that come with receiving a prize. Sorry, sorry Marianne, <laughs> um, we are doing a bad trick to you, but you have to get used to it because it's not the last one. And the heavy bag of medals doesn't appear in any case to be slowing her down. And you'll have to live with expectation. There is clearly much more uh, to come from Marianne, not least her lecture on gender inequality today. I'm delighted to welcome her to Toulouse and deeply honored uh, to introduce her as this were this year's winner of the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I don't think yeah, it's yeah. Great. Thank you so much for, uh, uh, for being here, and thanks a lot, Jean, for the really, really kind uh, introduction. So um, this is a very broad um, title, and this is not working. I can use my fingers? Yes. Is there any way to get this to work, maybe? OK, great. So this is a broad title, and, and I guess this is going to be fairly broad as well. Um, my goal is really to just kind of walk you through through what I view as being kind of the most pressing remaining issues um, in terms of um, kind of improving gender uh, equality in the labor market. So I'm, I'm going to be wide more than deep on, on any single topic. Now, before I get started, I think it's, it's really important to realize that we obviously live in a moment where concerns about rising income inequalities are, are everywhere, you know, in the US, in, in Europe. And if you look at the whole agenda surrounding issues of inequality, gender provides the most optimistic lines. We've made tremendous progress in 
develop in developing world. There's, there's really an echo. Do you hear it as well? Yeah. Should I try? Okay, should I try? It's really hard to read. All right, so well, there's going to be more pictures than words. All right, I'm going to keep on going. So, so I'm going to talk, you know, there's going to be two parts of the lecture. Uh, I'm going to first take a worldwide perspective and, and focus on issues of differences in labor force participation between men and women. That's really the main thing that we can study systematically throughout the world, where finer data on income is just simply not available. But then I'm going to focus on the more developed world, which you know, will stand for the OECD, and there I'm going to dig deeper into other factors than just labor force participation, but also talk about issues related to, uh, to pay uh, and the gender gap in earnings, which remains quite high, especially at the top of the income distribution. Now, a recurring theme throughout most of the lecture is going to be that beliefs about gender roles are a or the key force that are still hold, holding women back today. Right. Even though, as we move to different places, the nature of these beliefs is going to be quite different, from quite hostile to more uh, benevolent in some context. Now, before moving into, you know, into the data, I think it's, it's worthwhile to remember kind of why we care about these questions. And, and from my perspective, there's really two reasons as to why I care about this topic. The first one is you know, an argument about fairness and justice, kind of a Rawlsian argument that it seems that we would like to live in a society where everyone has got the same opportunity, right? So the same argument as to what we care about social mobility is an argument as to why I care about you know, issues related to gender equality. But there's another argument, a more utilitarian argument, which is that if you think about um, men and women being born with the same distribution of talents, right? It has to be that a society is not, is not going to be at its frontier in terms of efficiency if it has so much imbalance between the genders in terms of being in the labor force and being successful in the labor force. So you can really both view this as like a question that is about justice and fairness, but also a question about efficiency. Now, in the background of all of this, I think we live in a moment where at least I perceive a, you know, a wave of renewed conservatism uh, gender conservatism. I think there's a public intellectual, I don't know how prevalent he is in France, he certainly is very much so in Scandinavia, um, that's Jordan Peterson, that has been bringing back some essentialist views about the difference between the gender, kind of going back to the point that the reason why women are not succeeding as well as, as much as men in the labor force is because they're just different. The idea that gender roles is not something that's socially constructed, but something that is biologically determined, right? So I'm also going to try to spend some time during uh, the lecture to talk about this. You know, in a sense, how much do we know about the extent of gender differences in trait, in psychological attributes, in preferences? And how much do we know about you know, whether the beliefs we have about these gender differences are or are not accurate? Okay, so I'll do some of that, and that's gonna be, in a sense, more psychology than, than economics. All right, so let me get going. So hopefully these are gonna be big enough. So as I said, I'm gonna start with the world, and this is kind of what the world looks like today. What it looks like in terms of what we can really study in terms of women in the labor market, which is just a rate of female labor force participation. Okay? Every point on this graph is one country in the world today, big and small. And what you can see there is that there is what is now well known as a U-shaped relationship between economic development, which is on the x-axis, and the rate of labor force participation by women. Okay? You can see exactly the same picture if you don't simply look at female labor force participation, but look at the ratio of female to male labor force participation. Okay? So what is behind this relationship? I think the common interpretation of this relationship is that it has to do with structural change. Right? That when economies are poor, they start with a very large agricultural sector. Think about you know, these poor economies, everyone works on the farm, the separation between work and home is trivial, and we have lots of women in work, labor force in this context, because work and home are essentially the same place. Now, as economies develop, they typically first start to grow their manufacturing sector, and then when they are you know, even richer, they become more focused on, on the service sector. Now, the story about female labor participation and structural change, essentially, 
When you start very poor, it's all happening in the farm. The woman is involved. Everybody's involved, in fact. We have lots of children, high fertility, and every hand is uh, are on deck. Now, as economies become richer, work moves towards the factories. The factories are further away from the home. It's harder for the mothers to free yourself from the children. Moreover, the work in the factory is going to be more physically intensive, and women don't have often the strength to do that. And then finally, as we move forward with this process of development, we've moved to like easier jobs, jobs that do not require as much physical strength. And we've also moved to societies where fertility rates have dropped and women can more easily kind of, you know, free themselves from the home to, uh, to start working. Okay? So that's the typical kind of explanation behind the U-shaped relationship. Now, if you look at the data today, there's really little evidence for that story. Right. What I'm plotting here is the relationship between female labor force participation, change in female labor force participation over the last 25 years, and change in the size of the agricultural sector, change in female labor force participation, and change in the size of the manufacturing sector, change in female labor force participation, and change in the size of the service sector. You would expect you know, to see patterns here that would be reminiscent of the issue shape relationship. In fact, you essentially see a lot of flat lines. The story doesn't seem to match the data today. Now, there are lots of reasons as to why it may not match the data today, is that it may have been a very good story for the past, but not for the present. Why? Because things have changed. So first, one thing that may have held women back before in terms of moving towards manufacturing is that they were very poorly educated. And we've made a huge amount of progress in ed educating girls in, you know, in the US, and work like the one that Esther and Abhijit have been doing has been you know, an important part of this story. So, there's been improvement in female education, so maybe that has changed the dynamic that existed in the past. It's also true that fertility has been declining throughout the world, so women may have an easier time now kind of like moving straight out of agriculture into manufacturing because the size of the home and the amount of home production is somewhat smaller than it was in the past. These are very possible explanations. Now, what I'm going to do instead you know, of those explanations as to why the U-shape doesn't the story for the U-shape doesn't fit, is just try to draw to your attention to, I think, one important underlying force is behind the U-shape. And I'm going to do that by adding another set of data to the World Bank data I've used uh, so far. It's data that we have on social media. So in particular, there's a data set that collects for not every country in the world, but quite a few countries. Um, a set of uh, measures of social attitudes. In, part in particular, it has questions about gender attitudes. Now, one such question, which I'm going to use multiple times throughout the lecture, is this one. People are asked in the survey, representative samples of individuals, are asked whether when jobs are scarce, men have more of a right to these jobs than women do. Okay? So what I'm going to do is classify the world in terms of what share of respondents would answer yes to this question. And we'll do that very roughly by kind of isolating countries where less than 25% of people would agree, such as France, from countries where between 25 and 50% of people would agree, and countries where more than 50% of people would answer yes to this question. Okay? And if I do that, well, this is kind of what you observe. So the first one is, before the three categories, is simply looking at the fraction of people that would say yes to this question. The higher this fraction, the more sexist the place is. Right? And you can see that there's a clear, you know, kind of relationship here, is that places that are more, more sexist they have lower rates of female labor force participation. But more importantly for, you know, for my, uh, my point is this. This is kind of what's behind that U-shape that I started with if I separate these countries into the three groups that I discussed before. So what it looks like is just you know, kind of not so much of a U-shape, but more like three straight lines with one line that's well below the other ones, the blue lines, the high success country lines, and, you know, kind of behind this is kind of why we see the U-shape uh, relationship. So it's not, you know, kind of when you look at the world this way, it looks like one driving forces of why labor force participation is still so low in, you know, some countries has got to do with, uh, with these social norms. All right, so what's also true about these places is that those most sexist places, not only do they start with much lower rate of labor force participation, but the extent to which labor force participation by women has been going up 
has been much smaller in those places than everywhere else, everywhere else in the world. Now, by the way, we can see hidden by, by, behind this picture is that you can see that every dot is essentially above zero. So there's really an optimistic message there, which is that essentially throughout the world, labor force participation by women is higher today than it was 25 years ago. But the extent to which we've made progress has been much, much lower in those countries that already started with lower rates of female labor force participation. All right. So, you know, I think this cross-country exercise, I mean, I do a lot of micro work. This is macro data, and I'm not comfortable with it. And there's a lot of other explanation one may have behind, you know, kind of these blue dots and why these places are different behind norms. I think another way to kind of see this is to focus on a few examples. And one example that I find particularly important is the one of India. Why? Because India is, you know, what fraction of the world? Like, you know, nearly a third of, you know, the world population may live in India or a quarter. Uh, and if you look at India on this graph, India is actually one of the very rare countries where female labor force participation has been on the decline. It is going down. It is lower today than it was 10 years ago. All right? So there's a way to look at India and really, again, show the importance of the social norms. So why is it nice to go within a country? Is it go within the country where the environment is given, the schooling is given, the return to schooling is given, the industrial structure is given. Now, how can I see differences in norms within a place like India? Well, I think there's two ways you can easily do that. One is to look at religious groups, and one is to look at castes within the Hindus. So this is what India looks like. This is data that only covers the last five years, I believe. And what, have on, what you have on the y-axis is female labor force participation. And it is as a function of the income of the household, the per capita income of the household, zeroing in any labor force participation of the woman. And then you have three lines, one that separates Muslims, one for Muslims, one for Hindus, and one for Christians. And you can see that this is the same country, the same economy, the same forces, but you have substantial differences in female labor participation between these three groups. And it goes the way you would expect, which is the more conservative, gender conservatives, are going to be the Muslim and the Hindus, and the Christians are, you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat less so. You can also see these pictures, you know, kind of strikingly, if you just look at the Hindus, and separate different castes, right? So the strengths of the gender norms are going to be typically much stronger among upper caste individuals than lower caste individuals. So what I did there is just take Hindus, look at the same relationship between female labor force participation and log household income per capita, but separating, starting from the, the highest status, upper caste, other backward caste, scheduled caste, and scheduled tribe. And these lines essentially kind of stack on top of each other the way you would expect. Right? So it's really remarkable that among upper caste Hindus, whatever the household income is, female labor force participation on the 25 to 54 year old group never gets much beyond 16, 16%. All right? So I think visually this tells you that in a place like India, these social norms are really, really an important force. All right. Now, what I want to do is just say a few things about policy in places like that, right? So what, 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 what do, how do you get change, right? How do you change this and how do you change these norms? And I think one thing that I feel I've learned from reading the economic history literature is that you need big shocks for change. So Claudia Goldin, who's one of my heroes, has written a lot about the transformation of work for women People like Rachel Fernandez have also made a you know, really important contribution. And one thing that you learn from their work is that an event such as World War II was really important in moving our, the US economy at least kind of forward in terms of more equality in the workplace. Men were sent to war. That mechanically moved women into work. We needed women to fill in these jobs, right? And that really was important. I think it changes the political economy it changed the norms. We have evidence that you know, men that had a mother that worked during the war were also more likely to have a working wife because what? they were exposed to a woman that worked and got comfortable with it. Right? So if you take that logic about the World War II chalk and think about applying it to places like India, 
and some of the other blue countries I discussed before, there's really an important sense that we need job creation in those places, right? And you know, what I, what I, what I try to do over there, and, and I'm sorry again if, if the, the visuals are not so great, but I try to kind of look over a 10 year period at the relationship between the change in the men's unemployment rate and the ratio of female to male in the workforce. Right? Again, separating my low sexism, mid sexism countries from the high sexism countries. And what you can see is that the slope of this relationship is different in the high sexism place. What it looks like is that in those high sexism places, whenever the unemployment rate for men goes up, women make less headway in terms of further e e equalizing their rate of labor force participation with that of men. That's, I think, one visual way you can think about the importance of creating jobs. It's only when you know, there will be jobs that a lot of the reforms that may be needed to make the economy more amenable to women will, uh, will happen. Absent that, I think it's hard to imagine how you get this place rolling, absent putting in place maybe some quotas, but you know, I don't think we know much about how quotas would work, quotas would work, would, would work for women in places where there's so much resistance to having women in the workforce. I mean, another way to, you know, to say all this, again, is to talk about you know, India, which you know, I think is fascinating because um, of um, the, the decline in female labor force participation. And if you read about what's happening in India over the last you know, kind of decade or so, is that there's lots of discussion of jobless growth in India. Uh, it's not so clear why, you know, there's some sense that automation is happening faster than people expected. There's a sense that India may not be as competitive with like even poorer countries like Vietnam and may not be attracting much of the manufacturing from uh, the developed world. There's also some discussion that India's growth is actually not as high as it claims, so people are making up statistics. Uh, whichever story it is, India is not creating jobs. And literally, when jobs are scarce, men come first. And you can see this strikingly in the unemployment figures. This is looking by education level, one least educated, seven more educated, the unemployment rate of men and women in India. The female unemployment rate, and remember, very few women are in the workforce, right? So it's like less than 20% of the population is in the workforce. And the females are looking for jobs, cannot find them. The female unemployment rate is fivefold the men unemployment rate, especially among the heavily educated. Okay. Now, before I move on, there's also some research that suggests, well, maybe I'm being too pessimistic. Maybe these places can change without the kind of drastic um, job creation event that I just described. So here's an example of one paper, a very recent paper that I like. This paper that was done uh, in Saudi Arabia, which falls very much in the blue, uh, the blue line. Um, it's about like India in terms of female labor force participation. So what did they do in this paper? Well, they documented a phenomenon that people would call pluralistic ignorance. So what is pluralistic ignorance? Well, it's a situation where people privately reject a particular norm, but they, in, they believe incorrectly that others accept this norm. And because they don't want to feel stigmatized, they also end up following the norm themselves. All right? So this is first on the left side. This is a survey that, uh, sorry, this is a graph that tabs what? Well, take a bunch of men in Saudi Arabia, which are typically the guardians of their wife, okay? And then ask them, um, do you think it is okay for wife to work outside of the home, okay? So that means that if I ask a large group of men, I can do, well, this is a percentage of men in Saudi Arabia that agree with the idea that it's okay for wife to work outside the home. And then you can ask them to guess what fraction of men in the room would think it's okay for your wife to work outside of the home. And then you can look at the difference between those two, right? The share that, you know, kind of that I guess the share of men, I guess, would agree it's okay versus the actual share that would say it's okay. And this is what the first graph tabulates. And what it shows you is that most men are wrong. Most men believe that a much higher share, share of men in the society would be disagreeing with the view of having working women inside the, outside the home. Let's put it this way. Sounds like lots of men are okay with their wife working outside of the home, but they believe that their neighbors are not okay with it. 
And because of that, maybe they wipe don't work. So what the second graph indicates is that it sounds like simple information intervention can actually be successful in changing behavior. What if I look at these men that have these incorrect beliefs about you know, how many of their male neighbors disagree with the idea of having their wife working outside the home, and I simply tell them, well, you know what, you thought the share was 60%, but in fact, it's only 20%. Just give them this information, and then you know, kind of track some behaviors which they do here by looking at whether or not these men sign up their wives for some kind of job agency. And the evidence suggests, again, the group that's relevant is the group over here, where the wedge is negative, that when you tell these guys, you know, your beliefs were incorrect, they start changing their behavior, right? So whether, you know, this works beyond signing up your wife for a job agency, whether this has any impact, you know, real impact in the long term, that's hard, you know, I think, to, sh to, to determine. I think there's going to be much more work being needed, but what's nice about something like this is that it's, it's very easy, it's very cheap, it's just an information intervention, and it's hard to see what kind of adverse consequences it would have. So more information about, you know, um, our, you know to combat pluralistic ignorance might be important. Okay, so before I move to the developed world, which, you know, will take me... Uh, more time, I just want to take a quick detour and, and talk about life satisfaction. And I'm going to show you the connection of this to my first part very quickly. So this is another thing that we can study throughout the world. And what you're seeing here is essentially every dot again is a country. I've population weighted the country, so you can see where India and China are. I think that's, that's all I can guess. Um, and what I report on the y-axis is an index of life satisfaction for men and women. So representative um, samples of individuals are being asked, how good do you feel about your life at this point in time? And this is data that covers about the last 10 years. And then there are really two things you can see here. First, as Angus Deaton has shown in the same data set, is that there is a very strong positive relationship between level of economic development and level of life satisfaction in the data, right? So again, what does it mean? And it's not obvious it should have happened this way, but it means that people over there in Togo, right, when they think about their happiness, they are thinking global. They are not just looking at their society, they understand that there are people up there in Denmark and things are better there, right? So higher income means higher level of life satisfaction. Now, if you look at the gender gap in life satisfaction, it is very small, right? You can infer that from like, you know, the size of the difference between the two lines and the slope of the line. Uh, and except in very poor places, look like women rep report higher level of life satisfaction than men. You see about the same if you look at ex expectation of how good life will be in the future, except that the, the slope of the line is less steady, but again, women look, you know, kind of more optimistic about their life in the next five years. Now, the reason I'm bringing this forward, despite, you know, kind of on top of just the interest of looking at this data, is that if you now go back to my three sets of countries, mid-sexism, high-sexism, low-sexism, and you compare the gender gap in life satisfaction in these three sets of countries, what you find is that women report higher level of life satisfaction compared to men in the more sexist places. It's exactly the opposite of what I presume most of you must have had in the back of your mind before I got into this data, right? You can do this by just using the three sexism measures I described. You can also do this by trying to isolate parts of the world where women labor force participation is abnormally low, controlling for lots of other stuff, which is what I do in the bottom panel. You see the same story, right? So it's exactly the opposite of what I think most of us would have expected. Now, I don't want to do too much of this, but I think it's, an important, it's still an important fact. So first, it's reminiscent of things that we've seen in the developed world, where we can do this kind of analysis within countries over time, and where there's evidence that female life satisfaction has been going down, both in absolute term and in relative term compared to men. Now, that's the interpretation of this fact is tricky, and there are many, and I'm not going to be able to throw them out. So 
One is like when they ask these questions compared to whom? Are they comparing themselves to women in Denmark? Are they comparing themselves to women in the US? Are they comparing themselves to other women within the countries or other men? It's, it's not clear. So who the comparison group is might be important. What's also important to realize is that these measures of less satisfaction, even though I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about them, and how they could be placed on measures of GDP, they are very imperfect in capturing the thing that matters in life. They don't capture things like agency and control. And maybe that's the important part that's missing. It could very well be also that the fact that there's limited freedom for these women in those countries also does not allow them to, you know, kind of to think you know, outside, um, outside this box. Now, as I said, I don't have the explanation, but I, still, I, still, I think it's still relevant when you think about the political economy of change in those countries. Right, the perception you may have in your back of your mind of like pent-up demand, like of women really wanting change because they know how much better their life they could be if they were more, you know, including the workforce, is not the situation that, that's on the ground, right? Um, you could do the same, and I'm kind of looking at the time, maybe I'll go quickly through this, by looking at something else, which is experiential well-being. So Danny Kahneman was, you know, kind of really influential in helping us think about other ways to measure well-being besides asking people, how happy are you? Which is essentially, tell me about your day yesterday. Did you have positive feelings? Did you have negative feelings? So we can use the same data and look at gender gap in life satisfaction. Positive emotions, negative emotions. Here, strikingly, I don't actually never seen this finding before, women actually report lower level of experiential utility than men, mainly because they report more negative effect than men do. But again, my goal is really more to tell you about how these varies with the sexism level. And again, in this case, you find, I think, the non-intuitive results, is that the gender gap in experiential utility is smaller. Women are relatively happier in the more sexist places than the less uh, sexist one. Same message. I think it's important. I don't think it can be ignored, and I think it's important as we're going to think about policy. All right. So. That's kind of the first part of the lecture. What I want to do now is just talk about the rich -er world, which in my context is going to be uh, the OECD. So I'm going to give you a few facts first, show you what the world looks like today, and then I'm going to talk about what I think are the most important factors to keep in mind as we think about the future and further moving forward with gender equality. I want to talk about educational choice, and I know there's lots of young people in the room, so I Practically happy to talk about educational choice. I want to talk about the motherhood penalty. I want to talk about, especially in light of this motherhood penalty, how we design family policies and tax policies. When I get to that stage, it's going to be the right time to take a little digression on, you know, kind of the nature of the remaining gender stereotypes in our societies today. Not Saudi Arabia, not India, but our societies today. And then, especially in time permit, I want to talk about sexual harassment. So, I. I think this is a topic that has taken a lot of the oxygen over the discussion about gender over the last few years. It's not a topic that economists address. It's not a topic for which there is much data. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what I think we can understand and not understand about, uh, about this. Okay, so I'll finish with that. Okay, so number one. So this is the rich world today. Um, this is every OECD country in uh, 2014, and this is the average gap in labor force participation, which is about 13% uh, across the OECD, and the average gender pay gap, uh, which is the gender pay gap among people that work full-time. So this does not include the idea that more women than men uh, work part-time. The average pay gap is about 15%. So think about it is that for every dollar that a man earn on average across the OECD, women earn 85 cents. Okay? And the US is kind of like, you know, in the middle over there. And obviously, the better part to be is that low quadrant um, over there where, where France, France belongs. So from an international, from an OECD perspective, actually France is doing is doing quite well. It is very much in the company of your usual suspects, which are mainly Scandinavian countries. Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, when you think about those fairly high rates of female labor force participation in the OECD, that hides a lot of part-time work. Um, 
for reasons that you know, I think will become very clear later. It's not the case, though, that the countries that manage to get lots of women in the workforce only do that by getting just higher share of work. Strong relationship between labor force participation and the gap in labor force participation and the share of women working part-time. But this is a phenomenon that I think is under study, but like, look at a place like the Netherlands, 40%, 45%, I think, of women are working part-time. All right, so this is nearly the norm uh, in some OECD countries. All right, and then this is progress. You know, this is the progress that I discussed. This is a change, this is a, only 10 years of data, but even in a short time period, you can see that essentially all of the countries have managed to both reduce the gender gap in compensation and increasing the relative rate of female labor force participation with some clear success stories, and as I said, just a few countries that you know, kind of have not succeeded, have not made as much progress. The US is over there, and it's very well known that the US you know, experience over the last, in fact, 20 years has been a much more negative one for women than, than, in, uh, than it has been in lots of European countries. We have not made much progress, either on closing the gender gap in earnings or closing the gender gap in labor force participation. All right. And, you know, this is a change in part-time work. Again, no clear relationship, which says that lots of countries have managed to get more women in the workforce, not simply by creating more part-time work. All right. The other big fact about the world is that those fairly low gender gaps in compensation hide a glass ceiling, right? Which is that if you start looking at the earning distribution of men and women, what you see clearly is that the higher up you go into the income distribution, the less represented women are. So I can do this with data, but maybe we can um, celebrate uh, Thomas Piketty and do it with the kind of pictures he can draw because he has tax data. So this is the US over a um, 20 year period, plus more than 20 year, and this is the share of women that work essentially kind of um, ne nearly 50%. And then this is the share of women that have earnings in the top 10% of the income distribution. Equal representation would be about 50% today. It's only 25%. And the higher up you go into the income distribution, the fewer you find women to be. Okay, That's really the glass ceiling phenomenon in the picture. And recently, um, Piketty and Carthers have produced essentially the same picture for France. This is your glass ceiling. And, you know, your glass ceiling actually look quite similar to the U.S. glass ceiling, right? So the projections, if you extend those lines, is that uh, women would achieve, achieve parity in the top 0.1% of the income distributions in France by 2144, which is fine, but it's still a long time ago, a long time to go. All right, so these are the main... Um, the main facts. Now, I want to talk, as I said, about a few things. The first one is educational choice, because I still believe that educational choice is an important thing that we need to address to think about making further progress. So what do we know about education? I think there's a tendency to say that women have you know, no disadvantage compared to men when it comes to education. In fact, the quick line now is to say that women are doing better they've reversed the gender gap in education. Women are more educated than men. And in fact, that is true, right? So this is again the same OECD, and this is the share of men with a bachelor's degree, compare, or more, PhD included, versus the share of women with a bachelor's degree or more, okay? And this is the 45 degree line, and what you can see is that essentially every country except Japan is um, on the side of women having more education than, uh, than men do. Now, what's, I think, more um, problematic is that behind this success story, there remain very large differences in the kind of things women study compared to guys. Right? So this is business and law, and there you've got countries on each side of the 45 degree lines. So, but this is, I think, the problem. This is STEM, right? This is the share of males that study a STEM field in tertiary education versus the share of women that do STEM education uh, in tertiary education. And every country is way, way below the 45 degree line. In fact, 
you know, kind of there's a positive relationship, but it's, it's very small. You can see the same when you start kind of looking within the STEM and look at something like information technology. That's software engineers. Or look at kind of your regular engineers. Every country is strikingly below these 45 degree lines. That means they're going to be areas to compensate, and you know, they are the ones that you would expect, which is there are much more women following with this liberal arts uh, path. Okay? So why, why is this problematic? I think it's problematic for you know, kind of the reason that the kind of fields we find more women in are not well-paying fields. And that's very straightforward to, you know, to see. I think The Economist has been running a story in my Twitter feed over the last week, kind of showing you these graphs better than mine. This is my attempt to look at, if you look by birth cohort in the US, and for every birth cohort of male and female, try to do the expected earnings simply based on the field that they've chosen to study. Right? And then compute the gender gap in earnings. What you can see is that whether you look at the mean gender gap in earnings, just determined by field of study, or gender gap at the 80th percentile, 90th percentile, we've made progress from the 1950s to about the 1970s birth cohort in getting women entering better paying field. But that progress has nearly stopped since the 1970s birth cohort. Now, the other reason why this is important is that the kind of fields that women seem to shy away from, which are the STEM fields, are actually really good fields for them. So I, mean, I can see the danger of what I say, because I think no one has a sense as to what the labor market is going to look like in 10 years or 20 years. But today, these are really good fields for women. These are fields where the earnings are high. This is a graph from Claudia Goldin's um, presidential address uh, a few years back. These are high earnings fields. They are the triangle in the green. And also fields where the gender differences in earnings between a female software engineer and a male software engineer is very small. That's in contrast with the kind of fields I have my students, which is business, which are very well-paying fields, but fields where also women really struggle to achieve the same level of earnings as men. Right? So this imbalance is really important. Now, what's behind this imbalance? I think we need to understand. So the typical story is this one which is the one that you know, uh, Larry Summers made famous when he said something that upset it, quite a few people, which is women are just not good at math. Right? So this is the PISA data. So PISA data set is an international data set, standardized testing across many places in the world. So you can really use this data and dig in understanding uh, gender difference. And you can see that, indeed, there are a few exceptions. There are some countries where women do better on the PISA math test than men. but the majority of the countries are still below this 45-degree line. That's in contrast with this, which is science. Testing in science looks fairly balanced between the gender. And reading, where there every country is above the 45-degree lines, which means that women do substantially better than guys at, you know, kind of the reading uh, testing. Okay. So, how important is this? So I think the first thing, too, that I want to stress is that the gender gap in math, based on all that we know, doesn't have much to do with nature, but it's also something that's been socialized. Right? So we have now multiple studies that tell us that. This is one study that was conducted 10 years ago that essentially established a correlation between the gender gap in math within a country and gender attitudes in that country. In places, you have more gender conservative norms the gender gap in mass is bigger. In places where these gender norms are much more neutral, Iceland, there's essentially no gender gap in math. Right? So this has a lot of social, cultural influences embedded into it. There's another recent study which I really like by Claudia Senik that also shows the power of social norms in affecting mass testing. She contrasts Eastern and Western Europe. So whatever you may dislike about socialism, there's a lot. Um, they really tried really hard to get women included and tried to indoctrinate, you know, kind of more gender equality. And you still see this in the PISA testing for these ex-socialist countries today. Is that the gender back in mass is substantially smaller in Eastern Germany than in Eastern Europe than Western Europe. Claudia also shows that if you look within Germany, 
women do better today in Eastern Germany than they do in Western Germany. So point number one, those differences in math, they are importantly related to norms. Point number two is, you know, even if there are still gender differences in, ma in mass, how big are they? Can they really explain why, you know, kind of Google and Facebook find, you know, kind of cannot find, um, you know, software engineer? Now, there's a standard way to measure gender differences in attributes in psychology. That's called the Coins D statistic. So, what is that? It's taking the difference in the means for men and women and dividing that by the pool standard deviation of um, values for men and women. Right? So this is a useful statistic. And just to give you a sense of what the statistics mean, for D value of 0.1, there will be about a 92% overlap between two, the male and the female distribution. For D value of 0.20, there will be an 85% overlap between, uh, between the distribution. So small and moderate values of these D statistics are consistent with gender differences in mean, right? but not large ones. When you look at them visually, essentially these distributions are overlapping one another. Okay? Now, all of the work that's been done recently on the gender gap in mass suggests that the magnitude of this gender gap is indeed within the range where Cohen would say this is essentially gender similarity. These are very, very small differences. This is a meta-analysis that was done in the US across all grades. You can see the Ds ranging from 0.01, in fact, minus 0.01 to 0.06, very tiny differences. Those differences remain true when you focus on the harder, more complex mass scales. Um, and there are data from other countries, developed countries, that make the same point. So even if there's a gender gap in mass, it's very, very small. There's essentially overlap, mainly overlap, between these two distributions. That may explain why you know, we only have males that are Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page, but not why we can't find you know, female software engineer. Okay? Now, what I you know, find interesting is this particular study, which I believe comes from PSC and I just discovered. So, if it's not about mass ability, then what is it about? Right? Why these women systematically stay away from these fields? So one is just the point about role models. And that's kind of, you know, if you think about the struggle that we have in economics right now, you know, we think that's an important factor, that young women are not finding enough female role models in economics, and that's why they're staying away from the field. It might well be that it's a matter of preferences, but, you know, kind of, um, this is the messy economics part, Jean. Like, I don't believe that preferences are given. I believe preferences are malleable, and they're also a reflection of, of, of norms. Now, what I think is another very orthogonal explanation is that it might very well be a matter of comparative advantage. So this is a study that was just published um, that, again, uses the PISA data, and then look at the relationship between how well students are doing by this side in mass and their intention to study mass in the future. Right? These are 15-year-old kids. And what you can see, for girls and for boys, there's a positive relationship. The better you are in math, the higher your interest in studying math in the future. But at every decile, the male distribution is way above the female distribution. At every level of like, math ability, guys want to study more math. That's the puzzle that we're trying to explain. Now, what's remarkable is the last picture, which does what? It's not looking at how well you do in math, but it's looking at ranking students based on their comparative advantage in math versus reading. Right? And now, when you start ranking boys and girls based on the comparative advantage in math versus reading, you see that these two lines are much closer to one another. So I think what's behind this is, and I have a 12-year-old, and I can see this happening, is essentially the following. My 12-year-old is really good at math, but she's a really talented writer. And she thinks about herself, I think, very naturally, like, what am I the best at? And she's better at reading. So what's behind this is potentially, I think, a really important explanation. If this is a big part of it, it also suggests some you know, levers. It suggests that the role of counselors is really important. Right? I, don't, I can tell my daughter that math pays better than you know, um, English, but maybe not all parents can do that. I have a comparative advantage in knowing these numbers. Um, but it suggests an important role for counseling. 
or at least you know, kind of making sure that students understand that some career paths have different implications for earnings, different implications for career flexibility, and all of that. So I think it's a positive story, because this might very well make a big difference. All right, next topic, I want to talk about motherhood penalties. I think this is the other really, really important thing that you should get out of this lecture if this is a topic that's new to you. Is that I think at this point in time, we're really in a situation where we understand that the old story, you know, the career family balance, is in fact the bulk of what's going on when it comes to explaining gender differences in earnings. These are now one, two, three, so I think these are six, story, six studies in total that six countries, and what do they do? They track male earnings and female earnings, and then they look at what happened to the earnings of male and female after the important event of the birth of the first child. You become a father, you become a mother. And what these pictures show is essentially that across all of these countries, Becoming a father has no implication for your earnings. Becoming a mother has dramatic, long-lasting implication for your earnings. Now, you have a huge motherhood penalty. I think visually you can see that the size of this penalty is not the same across all places. Right? It is much smaller in Denmark than it is in Germany. But all of these pictures show the same pattern. No penalty for becoming a father, huge penalties for becoming a mother. All right, so I love, you know, I love this picture because in a sense I feel like this is what, you know, probably we should be aspiring of. You know, if you think about a country that has made huge headway, it's a place like Denmark. And this is what has happened to the gender gap in earnings in Denmark over time, where the authors tried to figure out how much of the gender gap in earnings can they explain because of this motherhood penalty, how much of it they can explain because of the other things I talked about before, educational imbalances, and how much they cannot explain, which you can label whatever you want, maybe like just basic discrimination. And essentially the picture says that the gender gap in earnings has been going down in Norway, in Sweden, in Denmark, they're all the same. Uh, but the, not really all the same. Uh, but then if you look at today, the gender gap that remains, which is about a 20% gender gap in earnings, this includes part-time work, is solely due to the motherhood penalty. Denmark has fixed educational imbalances. It has gotten rid of this residual, let's call it like just pure discrimination, taste-based discrimination. And the main issue they still face right now is fixing this motherhood penalty. Okay? And the size of this motherhood penalty seems as large today as it was 30 years ago. All right. So what drives a motherhood penalty? I think we know a lot about that as well, and some of it is obvious. One of it is just labor supply. The most obvious one is just some women leave the workforce. I mean, in the US, where we have very little government support for um, childcare, if you don't earn a lot, you might as well leave the workforce uh, to take care of your child. But it's more than that. It's not just leaving the workforce and having zero earnings. It's slowing down, it's working a few hours, it's working part-time. It's moving from the private sector to the public sector. And it's also, if you look at especially those higher status occupations in the economy, uh, a penalty you face because you need flexibility and work doesn't give it to you. And Claudia Golden has done the most spectacular work on this topic, but really showing that in those high status occupations like business and law, even taking a small amount of time off is going to have big penalties in terms of your wage. And being willing to work 100 hours a week is going to have huge benefits in terms of um, your wage rate. Now, all these things that drive this penalty, more constraint on job search for mothers. Again, kind of some of the most exciting work here comes from France and Thomas Le Barbonchon, who's been using French data and documenting the fact that, you know, shouldn't surprise us, but women, when they search for job, are looking at a more reduced option set. And why? Because they are not as able or willing to commute as men are, probably because they need work to be closer to the home. So Thomas shows that in the context of France, there's a big difference between men and women in terms of like the length of the commute they have that translate into low reservation wage for women than for, uh, than for men. So all of this matters. All of this, though, is going to be modulated by family policy, tax policy, and, and, and norms. So let me talk about, um, oh, before I do, maybe I'll just talk about that. 
All right, so what do we know about family policies? In light of all of this, what does it mean to design good family policies if the objective is greater gender equality, right? So we have maternity leave with, you know, kind of different kind of replacement rates and lots of variation throughout the world. The U.S. is down there. There's no federal maternity leave mandate in the U.S. A few states have them, but we are very much an outlier. Um, if you look at you know, kind of family relief policies, they are not substantially related to gender norms, right? It's interesting, we think about where these policies come from, where they might be a reflection of the views that people have. If you look across countries, it is not the case that there's a systematic relationship between gender attitudes and the length of maternity leave. I don't think that is that surprising, because if you think about maternity leave policies, they really have two goals. One is to help women work, but the other one is also a very gender conservative one, which is let's have children, right? So these two forces seem to counterbalance in terms of driving the political economy of, uh, of these policies. Um, now, this one is really strongly related to gender norms. Places that are more gender progressive have government spend much more money on early child education and childcare. And that, I think, again, makes sense because the political economy here is what? The goal of policies like government spending on childcare and early childhood is really to get women to work. There is no ambiguity here. And you see that in the cross-sectional uh, cross data. Now, what do we know about whether these policies are good or bad for women? Well, this is maternity leave and the two objectives we have, which is to get more women in the workforce and women to be closer to parity with men in terms of earnings. There's a mild positive relationship between the lengths of maternity leave and getting more women in the workforce. But there's also evidence that longer maternity leave, in fact, increase the gender gap in full-time employment. The gender gap in earnings, sorry, uh, for people working full-time. If you look at government spending on early childcare and childhood education, there is no ambiguity in the cross-sectional data. This spending is good is that it gets more women to work and it also reduces the gender gap in earnings. Well, this is just a cross-sectional data, but I think these cross-sectional facts very much hold true when you try to do the, create the more expansive work of you know, exploding all the changes in policies that have happened you know, among these 20, 30 countries over time. I think the main takeaway is that, and I'm not forcing you to read the slide, is that you there's a point at which too long of maternity leave is going to be bad for women, particularly their earnings, and particularly for the higher educated women. I think that should make total sense, is that if an employer has got a guarantee to rehire someone like three years down the road, he might even not hire this woman in the first place. So maternity leave policies, you know, cannot go beyond the nine months, 12 months before they become fairly detrimental to, uh, to women, the opposite of the objective. Now, when it comes to like, government spending on early childhood and child care, there's no ambiguity. Right? The more we spend across countries and change in spending across countries over time, the more women begin the workforce and the smaller is the gender gap in earnings. Okay? So I think this is important. Again, the US does very poorly on you know, kind of spending on, on, on children, and we are in a moment where we have this whole discussion about social mobility in the US as well. And if I read you know, my colleagues, that think a lot about social mobility, they say, well, child allowances is really the way to go. Allocation familiale, we don't have any such thing in the US. That could be an equalizer in terms of helping poor kids. Well, I would say that there's a double, you know, it could be a double win. I think policies like that, spending on children, could be good for social mobility and also good for more equality in the labor market. All right, so um, this is the daddy quotas. This is the other policy that John briefly mentioned, they are much rarer. I think they exactly hit at the right point, which is that we want more balance between the gender in the role that men and women play in the home. Uh, what do we know about the daddy quotas that exist in you know, kind of places like Scandinavia? Uh, we know that men take them, but they never take more than them. And we have, I think, too little evidence so far to assess whether or not these daddy quotas help women. 
But at the core, they remain very short in terms of their lengths. So uh, it may be uh, asking too much to see uh, big changes. The other thing that I'll say about this, which I think, again, is this point about, um, is when I looked at this graph, I was surprised to see Korea and Japan as being the most aggressive countries in terms of the length of the opportunities they are reserving. You know, no man takes up these, uh, these, these leave policies in Korea and Japan, which means that even if they are good policies, you're going to have to just do something to encourage take up, particularly in places where the norms go in the opposite direction. All right. I'm, I think good. I'm going to talk about this because I think tax policy is also important and certainly something that I'm not a public economist. I totally underappreciate it before reading a series of papers recently. Uh, and the particular aspect of tax policy that I think I want to discuss is the issue of joint taxation of, uh, of household income. Right? So this is work that um, Alexander Bick and Nicola uh, Fuchschundlin have been doing over the last few years. Uh, Here's, here's a story. This is the US, this is Germany, and this is Sweden. This is, depending on how many hours you work, with assuming that your earnings, your wage rate, is essentially the, avro, the average wage rate in, in each of these, these countries, the tax rate that you're going to be facing. Okay? So that's the first panel on the left. The picture is what? Well, the US has got lower taxes low tax rates on average, right? That's why the, the, the bold line is below. And then you've got Sweden and Germany that kind of look fairly similar in terms of their tax uh, profile and tax progressivity, okay? Now, this, now let's go to the picture, uh, the picture on the right. So what is that? Well, that's the tax rate that a wife would be facing in each of these countries, assuming that she's married to a man in that country who works about the average number of hours that men work, okay? And what you see, well, a very different picture. In particular, while in terms of progressivity, the US, sorry, Germany and Sweden look the same, when you look at the tax rate that the wives would be facing, she would work on top of her husband, well, now, Germany is uh, way up there, much higher, marginal tax rates, and the US and Sweden look much more similar. Why is that? Well, the reason is that in a place like Sweden, you have separate taxation. So when I work, it doesn't matter whether my husband or wife work in terms of like the tax rates I'm going to be facing. A place like Germany has got this form of joint taxation system, which is that when the wife, typically the second learner, works on top of her husband, the tax rate that she's going to face is going to be very high because her, hus her income comes on top of her husband. Right? I think it's an important fact. It's not about children, but I, you can see why it relates to children, right? Because you start a family, you know, you, you get married, even in the system of joint taxation, gosh, you know, kind of staying at home alone is boring. So I might as well work, even if I face a high marginal tax rate, because I, there's kind of complementary between me and my husband kind of taking leisure together. But once the children come into the picture, you know, this kind of complementary in leisure between the husband and the wife disappears, and these disincentive coming from tax system become much more important, I think. So that's a piece that I think I was not appreciating before doing this work, but I think we need to discuss more. And again, that's an easy one because we can change this system, right? We can change the way we tax families. Um, so that's the message of their paper. They do a lot of work. I don't know kind of whether you know where France sits here. So this is a sense of like how much tax you face as a woman in a particular country, whether you are single or whether you are married. And this is the 45 degree line. So a place like Sweden, is joint, it's separate taxation. So it is on a 45 degree line. It doesn't matter whether I'm married or not. But then you've got places like Germany, my country, Belgium, where there's strong disincentive for the second owner uh, coming from the joint taxation system. France is also a country where these disincentive effects um, are relevant. So this is important and is fixable, addressable via policy. Um, all right. I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I want to skip a few things, and I want to take stock, because I've given you a lot of facts. Um, but I also want to just do a little bit of reflection. So I believe that it's very clear that mothers today in our societies, 
still bear the entirety of the labor market's cost of, of giving birth. Uh, and maybe in the most progressive countries you can think about, maybe that's really the only thing that's left, separating men and women in terms of labor market success. I think it's also clear that the design of family policies, tax policies are going to matter, and there's ways to make this motherhood penalty bigger or smaller, depending as to how you design uh, those policies. Now, what does it mean to live in a society where this, you know, kind of, the child, this child kind of penalty is the key driver of gender, gender inequality. This is clearly not Saudi Arabia or India, right? I think it's really kind of saying that in the most, uh, in places like Saudi Arabia and India, we're talking about very hostile belief against women. Right? The idea that women don't belong in the workplace. In our societies, we're talking about beliefs that are not hostile, they're more benevolent. It seems to be beliefs of the kind, women are going to do better taking care of the kids, or maybe women have a preference for taking care of kids. Right? So what I want to do in the next few slides is just try to tell you a bit more about how much we know about this. Are these beliefs accurate? You know, kind of, is it true that women you know, are better at caring for children? Do we have the right beliefs about this, or are they inaccurate beliefs? Okay, so I'm going to do a little digression to talk about our understanding of gender stereotypes in the rich world today. All right, so in economics, how do we think about discrimination? I think we have, we've been stuck with our two workhorse model. One is the Beckerian state taste based discrimination. I don't like women, I don't want to work with them. I, I don't think that fits, right? Men like women a lot. Um, and then we have this other model, which is statistical discrimination. It's a model of discrimination that is based on beliefs, right? But rational beliefs, right? I'm not going to hire this African American person because, you know, I know that African Americans are less educated than, uh, than white people on average. And I know that correctly, and so I'm discriminating. But there's a reason for it. It's rational, and maybe, you know, from a um, philosophical perspective, we may not even want to have a problem with this. Now, when you look at the psychology literature and how they think about discrimination, their models are so much richer than ours, right? And in particular, they have also this belief-based model of discrimination, but they are much more willing to accept the idea that the beliefs that are driving, you know, the discrimination might be inaccurate, okay? So, this literature in psychology has really studied two things, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know. The first one is, number one, are there systematic differences between men and women? You know, are women better at caring? Or are they better at, you know, taking risk or all this stuff? Number one. And number two, are the beliefs about these gender differences accurate? Okay? So here's my reading of this literature. So this is a long slide and you can read it yourself. Right. Is that there's a lot of meta-analysis, and if you're interested in this, I suggest reading Hyde 2014, which is essentially, let's take all the studies that have been done on there, which are measuring hundreds of traits. As I said, you know, empathy, but, you know, you know casual sex, or risk-taking, you know, really, really hundreds of things that we think matter, and let's figure out what is the gender gap on all these things, right? And the overwhelming conclusion of this work is that for the vast majority of traits, those D statistics, which are the metrics, right, are very small. That means what? That over a lot of traits, there are gender differences. But the gender differences that exist are so small compared to the within gender variation that exists. Okay? So that's, I think, the overwhelming conclusion of this work that does not do one study at a time, but really tries to take stock of all that we have um, studied and learned. Now, there are exceptions. And, you know, I've written the, the code over there. And among the things that systematically differ between the gender, with these of values of like up to 0.8, so that means these distribution now are kind of really apart from one another, include things that I think we may associate with the idea of taking care. Like, you know, agreeableness, tender-mindedness, interest in things versus people, right? Women have got more interest in people than they have in things. So there might be here some roots for beliefs about women 
having an advantage in caregiving or maybe even preferences for caregiving. All right, so now comes the second question, right? Fact number one, most of the gender differences in traits are very small. There are a few exceptions. Question number two, are the beliefs that we have about these gender differences correct? Right? You can study that. And again, there's a large literature in psychology on this. And I would say this literature is mixed. You know, just like us economists, psychologists have got ideological battles. So you can read some articles that say one thing, and others that say another thing. I think the main takeaways is that the evidence is mixed. Um, as to whether or not our beliefs are correct. Now, the one study that I want to point your attention to, which to me makes a lot of sense in making sense of these results, is a study by my colleague uh, Nick Epley, who's, who's a psychologist. And here's the idea behind Nick Epley's result. Look at, if I were to ask you here right now, what's typical of a man, what's typical of a woman? What are the things that you really associate with a man, the things that you really associate with a woman? Right. We don't have the time to do this real life, but Nick did this with this uh, subject in the experiment. And that's what he found, and I'm sure you cannot read it. But the places where men and women are most are, are judged to be most different based on is empathy. Women are expected, when I think about women, I think about empathy. When I think about a guy, I think about not empathy. I think about aggressive, assertive. Uh, and when um, I think about a woman, I also think about warm. When I think about a woman, I don't think about happy. That's not, happiness is not a trait that I associate with women. Okay? So, now, well, the next part of the exercise, which I'm going to give you in words, because I think we are getting short of time, is... They hypothesize the following, is that beliefs are going to be much, likely, much more likely to be incorrect on those traits that we associate, you know, immediately associate with a gender. So the idea is, is that when I think about women, I think about warm and I think about empathic. This is an area where beliefs are going to exaggerate gender differences. On the other hand, when I think about women, I don't think about happy or unhappy. So this is going to be a trait where beliefs are going to be fairly accurate in terms of um, explaining, predicting gender differences. And this is exactly what they find in this study. So these are measures of empathy. A lot of these are eye tests where you kind of look at whether people are paying attention to faces. Uh, Baron Cohen is, you know, kind of has done the most important work on this. And the way you would read this, again, maybe it's too small, but let me tell you in words, is that women are more empathic than guys. This is an area where these statistics is actually fairly high. Women are more empathic, empathetic. But beliefs about how much more empathic women are than guys exaggerate the extent of these gender differences. Right? You would not find the same results for happiness where the beliefs are actually fairly accurate. So what's the bottom line of all of this? Is that women care but they probably don't care as much as you think, right? And, but he also says that, you know, I think in a sense there's a kernel of truth behind, you know, those beliefs that are inaccurate, right? All of this, I think, is quite important, right? Why am I stressing this? Because I'm trying to understand why we are stuck with this. So what do I, what do, I do with all of this? And these are going to be my few, my few last slides, and I'm sorry, the sexual harassment I won't have time for, but I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, I think it's important to understand that stereotypes are not just descriptive, but they're also prescriptive. And that the psychologists tell us very clearly, right? You know, descriptive, I mean, this is how people will behave. I predicted. Prescriptive, this is how I expect people to behave. So when I have a belief that women are caring, even exaggerated belief that women are caring, I expect them to be, uh, to be caring. Those prescriptive, you know, kind of descriptive nature of the beliefs uh, make it particularly difficult to undo the stereotypes, right? Because you expect this behavior, you receive this behavior, then you observe the behavior. This is this pattern of self-fulfilling prophecy that makes this kind of a vicious, um, a vicious cycle. So why are those remaining 
beliefs, inaccurate beliefs, particularly difficult to undo, I think it's a really good question. Uh, can I have multiple you know, explanations for it? No. First, because they're prescriptive. I already said that. You expect me to be caring, I'm going to be caring. Otherwise, you know, I may face some kind of backlash. That's one view. But I think the other thing that at least some psychologists discuss is that they're actually positive stereotypes. Right? It's not like you know, kind of women are, you know, are bad or they're lazy. You know, these are positive stereotypes. Women have empathy and they care. And these might be um, difficult to undo because at the core they are much less objectionable than negative stereotypes. All right. So what do we do with all of this? And these are going to be my last few slides so that there's five minutes for question. Um, I think that as researchers, we pay, we play a really important role, right? I think that we get, because of publication bias, because of the way journals work, because of what the media wants to talk about when it wants to talk about our research, we don't see all of data and all the facts. And we remember and we publicize the studies that find gender differences much more than studies that do not. I've, I've done it myself. I've talked about the research on gender gap and competitiveness. There's been 10 papers in that one paper I quote that find, you know, can't really replicate this systematically. So I think as researchers, we really, if we take our work seriously, face a responsibility to just do more meta-analysis. And our profession is really not doing a good job in incentivizing us in doing replication and summary work. But we need more of that. The second thing you know, related is just the role of the media, the internet, advertisers, in reinforcing those beliefs. Right? The UK just passed a new rule that says that if you are a media agency, the kind of advertising you can show on UK television cannot be stereotypical. I think these things are important. Right? Um, and there's obviously roles of parents and researchers. The last thing I would say is that I think this agenda also tells us that there's a role for you know, organizational practices, right? I've talked much less about what happens in the workplace, but I think it's important to realize that these stereotypes, these inaccurate stereotypes matter not just in terms of how husbands and wife decide on allocation of, uh, of time between the home and the workplace, but they also matter um, at work, right? So this role in congruity literature suggests that women kind of get treated differently because they're not perceived to have the traits that associate with leadership, maybe because they are perceived as being uh, too nice. So at the core, I think we need to educate much more, you know, kind of human resource managers, evaluators, about the prescriptive and, the, and um, descriptive nature of stereotypes. We need to make sure that people that make important decisions within an organization are doing so in, you know, with enough time to reflect on the decision. Again, this is usually true in psychology that says that we're going to rely on stereotypes much more when we feel rushed, stressed. So creating a good environment for people to you know, be evaluated, hiring decisions to be made, is going to be important. We also know that one way to avoid stereotypical thinking is to just try to get people to think about the individual and not just the category. Right? So, you know, the kind of, she's not a good fit, and that's my explanation as to why I'm not hiring this woman, should not be something that is, that is accepted by organization. Organization should have much clearer criteria in place that force the evaluators, the recruiter, to explain why she's not uh, a good fit, rather than just stating that fact. Um, I mean, at the end, I guess what I was going to say is that I've done lots of work related to quotas and how quotas can help women in the workplace. You know, I think it's just forcing diversity in organization. I'm, I'm skeptical as to this being the agent of change. Um, and I like to flip it, you know, kind of rather than this diversity and inclusion agenda that we have, thinking more about how we create inclusive organization and getting diversity as a knock-on of that is probably a better way um, to think about it. So I'm going to stop there because I know I went too long. There should be time for questions. So I won't tell you much about sexual harassment. But in a snapshot, I think that we can study it. I think there's data, and I think it is sometimes predictable. Organizational practices, organizational dysfunction, the way we write incentive contracts for people, the way we pay people, the amount of control we gave to people at work,
all these things seem to be correlates, at least, of sexual harassment. So it should not be a subject that we stay away of, from, because I think it is related to many of the things that we study. I'll stop there.